Hello, this is Elite Business Live 2022, and uh, we're back in person. I mean, last year we were here, but unfortunately our studio audience were not. So it's great to be uh, live in London and uh, joining you wherever you're uh, joining us from around the world. Uh, it's, uh, it's that time of the day where um, we are particularly focusing on talent, all things inclusion, and uh, I'm genuinely delighted to see the lineup we've got today. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Uh, first of all, another round of applause for Donna Kelly, and one of my favourite favorite keynote <laughs> this year, actually. Uh, I thought it was very, very, very enjoyable. Uh, shall I just very quickly introduce everyone and then we'll get into it. Uh, Kate, meeting you for the first time properly, but it's lovely to see you. Um, uh, Kate Rowlandson, uh, Chief Executive of Mediacom, um, a brand that sort of works with so many different organisations, but ha has a sort of a, a lower profile. Your campaign's agency of the decade, but I guess the people <laughs> you work with, those are sort of a bit of a who's who. J just remind us of the role you play. Okay, so I'm the CEO for Mediacom UK. So we have five offices across the UK um, and I lead the organisation. Yeah, and so Mediacom, what we'll find you doing is sort of buying um, you know, access and uh, negotiating access for some of the world's best known brands. That's where you fit in, if you like. Yes. So we invest um, our clients' advertising budgets in media. So we plan and buy where they should invest their advertising spend to drive the largest return. And we trade and, and buy that media space for, on their behalf. Brilliant. And roughly how many people here in the UK? Uh, 1,400. 1,400. Fantastic. Thank you, Kate, for joining us. Why don't we jump all the way down to the end? Uh, fantastic entrepreneur, Simon Crowther, uh, a, a, an awarded entrepreneur, a great British entrepreneur of the year. Very nice to see you. How are you, Simon? I'm good, thank you. That's how we met, isn't it? Back in, I think, 2015 at the Great British Entrepreneur Awards. You're right. And if you know uh, anything about Simon, you'll know he's the flood guy. <laughs> uh, as, uh, <laughs> but he's actually very cheery in person, given how you started started your business, FPS Solutions, a so flood protection solutions, but, but you started, let's be honest, off the back of quite a big problem. Yeah, my family home was flooded in 2007 and we were out of the house for nearly a year whilst it was repaired. Um, we were looking at ways to defend it and back then everything was either really slow or really expensive. Ended up importing a rollout Watergate barrier from Canada. Five years later, used it and it completely saved the house from flooding, but it wasn't available in the UK and we were still using sort of old fashioned technology like sandbags. Yeah. Um, I wanted to make a difference. We ended up getting the sole UK distributor rights for the product, uh, formed the company, and it's grown from there really over the last 10 years. So we're now, say, I'd say, industry leaders for sort of assessing flood risk for developments, but also through to management of flood risk as well. Brilliant. No, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, the, the elevator pitch. Uh, um, very, very good to see you again, Simon. Thank you. Jenny Knighting, it's lovely to see you. Uh, founder and chief executive of Nutcracker Agency. Um, big fan of your work, Jenny, because you're very interested in connecting different worlds. This is how I see it. Sales and marketing. Very passionate about how people tell their stories. Just tell us what else we should know. Yeah, so I'm founder and CEO of Nutcracker, as you said, Ollie. Um, and Nutcracker really focuses on aligning sales and marketing. A lot, lot of people think that salespeople are lazy and marketing people are fluffy, and actually neither is true. Um, and when you remove that bias and actually make them work together, you can get some pretty impressive results. And our focus is on joining up campaigns and really getting under the skin of what businesses need to enable proper and sustainable business growth. Got it. No, thank you. So sort of Mars and Venus, you're the sort of interplanetary connector. Well, we try. Yeah, no, good, right. uh, no, speaking of which, Rajib Day, who has a brain the size of a planet in my experience, uh, <laughs> and, and I'm honoured to say was a co-founder with me of Startup Britain. It's lovely to see you, Raj. Right, How are you? Something. Very well, thank you. Great to be uh, Serial entrepreneur, now co-founder of Learnably, which I think is fantastic what you've done. You've created a marketplace which puts people in large organisations and small in control of what they choose to learn from. Yeah, absolutely. So we're really shifting the narrative from learning and development being seen as a compliance function where you're just told you must do X and Y to really tapping into what employees want to learn based on how they like to learn. Mm. So if you like books, coaches, conferences, podcasts, articles, the full breadth of learning and development opportunities are available to you through your own personal development budget. Love it. So this is Learnably. And uh, what have you noticed in the last couple of years, Raj, about what people are selecting? and what they're, what, what they're choosing to learn. It's really, really interesting. So I think obviously with the, with the pandemic and the face-to-face -face courses were no longer happening, we saw a huge kind of surge in people requesting physical books, um, but also 
with things shifting to online, so webinars and, and, and online kind of courses. Um, and actually, when you leave people to their devices to figure out, it, they really demonstrate, they actually tell you about what they're thinking. So from a retention strategy, rather than pigeonholing people and thinking you're in marketing, therefore you're just going to see marketing, giving them access to a marketplace of data, sales, all sorts of content, they're actually demonstrating what they're, where, where their heads are and where they might want to go next. So how does it work? Do the companies give them a budget or something? If they do, they yeah. So every employee gets their own budget to spend. It can be a few hundred pounds to a few thousand pounds. And then they decide how they spend it, which means that rather than HR team second guessing what you might want to learn and then no one using it, actually everything that's being spent, people are actually going to use it because it's their interest. Charged, they're empowered. Mm -hmm. Got it. So this is Rajiv Day, founder of Learnably. Why don't we, um, by the way, really keen to get questions, observations from the audience online and, and in the studio today. But Kate, can I start with you? Just on this topic of inclusion, mm. what does that mean? Because it can mean a million things to a million people. What does it mean to you and why does it matter so much? So what inclusion means to me is that everybody in our organisation, irrespective of where they come from, their race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, social background, age, can bring their full selves to work every day and not have to worry about indiscrim uh, discriminatory behaviour, microaggressions or, or any kind of, you know, yeah. they, they can bring their full selves to work and that's fine. Um, and it also means that we have a diverse range of perspectives across all of our business at all levels in the business mm. and that those perspectives can be heard, yeah. importantly. Yeah. Uh, and I think this means that we have a happier organisation, a more engaged workforce, mm. and we're doing better work for our clients. Love that. So that will be music to the ears of a colleague of mine, Matt Phelan of the Happiness Index. On happiness, yes. so happiness can seem to some ears or some people as, as, as fluffy. Can you measure that kind of thing? Well, yes, you can. I mean, there is actually a happiness index that, that measured by YouGov for the UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and we've been tracking that quite closely through the pandemic, actually, because as you can imagine, it went down, it came up um, more recently, but now with the situation in uh, Ukraine, it's starting to, to go down again. Mm -hmm. But yes, you can measure it. We actually measure it. Uh, we measure engagement at a company level, um, which is really a measure of how engaged people feel with the company. So we see that as it's a measure of one to five. And do you mind me, sorry to geek out on this, yeah. but is, you, is there a tool you use yes, for that? Yes, we do. It's, a, it's, a, it's an online tool called Amber. Until Amber, yes. interesting. Okay, yeah. so, so give us, um, Jenny, Jenny, your take on inclusion. We'll just get some short, sharp contributions, and then we'll start to delve a little bit. Jenny? I thought that was an incredible summary, actually. Yeah. So um, I, I agree wholeheartedly with that as, as a summary. I, I agree. I mean, I think at Nutcracker, the point that Kate made in terms of bringing your whole self to work is something that I talk about a lot. You know, actually being yourself is OK, and it's more than OK, it's enough. It's how you should be. So I think that sense of not having to pretend to be something else or fit a stereotype of what it means to come to work is really important. Um, and I also think it's being aware of different backgrounds, different um, orientation, different, different, you know, however you feel, um, and actually making sure that you're responding in the right way to that. Because actually I've been thinking a lot about unconscious bias and my own unconscious bias we mm. all have unconscious bias and I think actually being aware of that and truly acting in an, un you know, in an unbiased mm -hmm. way is actually mm -hmm. vital for that inclusivity mm. so um I don't expect you to go as far as Donna has gone <laughs> on her storytelling but w what have you learned about your own unconscious bias Jenny well I mean no one likes to admit they have any um Correct. we all like to think that we um well, I certainly like to think that I'm educated, I don't have any bias, but I think owning up to the fact that we all have an unconscious bias is mm -hmm. actually really important. And I didn't mm -hmm. think I had any, but I think in light of work that's gone on across our society over recent years, I had to really put the spotlight on myself and think about that. Yeah. Um, and I think just, just uh, basic things like, you know, uh, when a CV lands across my desk, I no longer look at the name or anything other than their experience. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's affected by um, recruitment process, but it's certainly something I've made a point of doing. Yeah, no, really, really interesting. So, Simon, I mean, it would be quite easy to see um, inclusion in sort of very, very obvious terms, men, women. Just, just to help us understand how you see it, because it can be so much broader. Oh, so much broader. I mean, when you look at various different things, it might not just be gender, it might even be location. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's one thing we've actually seen come out of COVID as 
almost a benefit of people have had to make themselves more aware because they're not just in their comfort zone of their office with their colleagues. They might all of a sudden be thrown into an environment where they're speaking to people on other sides of the world and actually having to interact with different cultures. So it goes so much further than just thinking of um, male, female, and you know, different genders, how people identify themselves. And it's, it's having that self-awareness, like you say, Jenny, in terms of actually recognizing what we feel is you know, bias and actually how that relates and, and being able to you know, keep yourself educated on the different aspects because yeah. we can't all know everything, but we need to accept that we don't and actually mm. be forever learning. Yeah, well, especially on that international point, you know, um, language yeah. can stop someone contributing. So being conscious of that. We were having this conversation backstage and um, talking about actually STEM. So the industry I'm in is very male dominated. And then I said, but actually the only universal language really is maths. Mm. And when you're looking at different languages, so actually maths isn't something that's just for men at all. You know, it's actually completely universal. Yeah. And it, you know, it really is the- Totally, and, it, and if that. you haven't caught yesterday's keynote from Dr. Grace, then please have a look at that from yesterday. I mean, I guess, Donna, what's now coming into my mind is, what are the barriers to inclusion? Either, you know, they could be unwitting, let's be honest, in how we set our organisations up, things we do, things we say. What do you think? Um, oh, there is uh, the glass ceiling to start with. Hmm. Um, you know, any, every organisation um, would profess to not having a glass ceiling. I think the barriers uh, for that are to observe it and to recognise it. And this is about women not rising not, beyond certain roles? Not just women. I don't, th I don't think the glass ceiling is there for women. I think it can be uh, for any BAME community, uh, it. It, it, basically anything, you know. And I think the biggest barrier that we've actually got is not always the glass ceiling, so I think we've all tried to dispel that or remove that, but it, we call it the sticky floor. So the biggest barrier that you have is actually yourself, mm. and it's about having your own confidence that you mm. can do it. There might not be the role models, but don't hold back. Yeah. You know, push yourself, see what, you know, look at the career gaps, look at mm. the challenges mm. ahead of you, yeah. see what you need to do. So, so what, um, what, what else, Raj, what gets in the way? What have you noticed? Because you work with some such a range of companies, right? Yeah. Uh, so there's a great quote that I, I like. Um, it's by Verna Myers. Uh, she did a TED talk where she said that uh, turning up to uh, diversity is turning up to a party, but inclusion is being invited to dance. Mm -hmm. And being invited to being invited to dance was one of our core values from the outset. Um, now we've we've modified that to include intentionally, and intentionally being the word where I think you need to be very mindful of everything you do. And so when it comes to kind of uh, application processes, we we do blind CV screening, so we don't see people's names because we're conscious that that might influence how, how you do things. Even when it comes to learning and development and the whole approach is recognizing that just telling someone that they can learn, someone will have the confidence and that to go ahead and do that and ask for a 5,000 pound kind of investment mm. in themselves, but actually someone might feel that 50, 50 pound resource is not for them. And so democratizing that and letting people know that that is available to them is also important. And, and, and where are you at? On that same question on education, you not only led, you created Oxford Entrepreneurs, which went on to become the biggest society in the university. Are you, are you blind to education or is it oh, all Absolutely. So, no, no, not at all. And we were talking about that backstage as well. And I think actually it's really encouraging to see the rise of kind of apprenticeships and alternative paths into careers, particularly in the world of technology. So, you know, our CTO, um, both our CTOs, so the previous one, university, didn't even go to university, the current one that we've just, just bringing on, she was a university dropout. I think a lot of our team in, in the tech field didn't really have degrees and they're self-taught. And I think that's where the jobs of the future are going to come. And I think that's very encouraging and people, the younger generation need to, to recognize that. 100%. So, um, so let's start to look uh, for our first sort of round of questions. But Kate, can I bring you in on this sort of, what, what I'm really interested in is stuff that sort of happens almost unwittingly. And Donna's really got me thinking about this, just s stuff that you wouldn't have thought, oh, I've just seen what I've done there. So it's, it's the unwitting exclusion, if you like. Can you help me think about that? Well, I think one of the things that we've done a lot of work on in Mediacom over the last couple of years is this issue of microaggressions. So the commonplace comments, remarks, actions that marginalise groups. Mm. So to give like you what? some examples of that, uh, and this is a really shocking one, but it, it happens. I wasn't aware of this until I started this job and I was so deeply shocked by it. But touching black women's hair is a microaggression. Uh, touching black anyone's men's. hair. <laughs> well, yeah, but I think it specifically no. happens to Understood. people of colour yeah, uh, right. and black men and women experience this. Right. Imagine somebody touching your hair in the workplace. Right. 
it's terrible, it happens. And, you know, but is that there's also casual sexism, like, oh, you're such a girl, or, you know, the, we were talking about this backstage as well, the assumption that the woman in the room will make the tea, oh. serve the drinks, yes. you know, and all of these biases, they are microaggressions. And, you know, nobody wants to accept and admit that they happen in their organisation. Uh, I was quite nervous, honestly, about... Mm bringing microaggressions to light within Mediacom because I thought it might reflect badly on us, but actually I think it does the opposite. So what's the lesson, of, forgive me Kate, what's the lesson on how you raise, how you, how you confront this, and Donna had a really interesting example of defusing something in that sense, how you raise this without burning or bruising relationships? Yeah. So this is the real challenge, uh, and this is why we focus on allyship. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, trained all of our people in active allyship because it's very, very difficult if you see bad behaviour happening in the workplace to call it out in the moment. Yep. It's uncomfortable. You don't want to make people feel uncomfortable and, and like they're being you know, told off, uh, even though it needs to be raised. So we've tried to equip our people with the tools and the techniques to call something out in the moment if that's appropriate, but if it's not appropriate, calling something in after the event. So that, okay. that means after the event, you may take that person over to one side and say, what you just did or said in that meeting really wasn't appropriate and made me feel uncomfortable and I yeah. need to call it out. It. Or you just go via you know, an HR route. But I mm. think allyship mm. and training people in how to be better allies to their colleagues in the workplace yeah. is key. Yeah, and recognising that showing your support, yeah. for example, of gay pride mm -hmm. sends a message mm. to everybody you know that they can feel comfortable being whoever they want to be. Mm. Well, that's interesting because I mean, I think part of the issue with Pride, um, obviously it's a wonderful thing, but if you only show allyship in that month of the year, that's an issue. So one right. of the things that we did at Medicom, for example, is we fly our Pride flag outside the building all year round. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think you've got to show ally allyship all through the year, not just in Pride Month. But yeah. yes, it's a brilliant thing, obviously. Yeah. No, but, but it is important. It's not the yeah. sort of tokenism yeah. in that sense. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm looking for questions. So start to please, yeah, I see you. And I'm looking for others in the room. Uh, please go right ahead. Feel free to say who you are. You don't have to. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Mahmoud. And um, I loved what you said about education. But I think the main challenge that I have seen in practice in corporate, lo in corporate um, mechanisms is that Diversity in itself means that people have different cultures and what they perceive as offensive. So, for example, for me, I wouldn't mind anyone touching my hair. Like, I would even see it as offensive. Really? So how do you actually establish like, ways that make sure that everyone is comfortable, as in they come with their culture, but at the same time they wouldn't offend anyone? What a great question. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm tempted to throw it to Donna. Uh, well, every, everyone actually, but Raj is also nodding. Forgive me, Donna, do you mind? Because it's such a great question. No, I don't mind at all. Uh, I genuinely think it all comes back to that working with the networks to have a better understanding. Um, mm. You know, we, 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 as I said, you need to have lived the life to be able to share and educate others. You know, I, I can't sit here and say whether for a, a black female it would be offensive to touch her. I do know that that is actually true. Somebody did say to me that somebody said, oh, you know, are they, have you got a weave? You know, that kind of sort of cultural thing. It's not appropriate, right, to be asking somebody that sort of question. Um, and I said, share it, tell people, yeah. tell people that's your experience. You uh -huh. know, so we have these know-hows, as I said before, we run them at lunchtime, you're welcome to join or not join. We send out a communication to all of our staff, inviting them to attend, giving them a bit of a highlight about what we'll be talking mm -hmm. about and hope that everyone attends and enjoys. If you want to take that to an extreme, have a look at the Human Library. I interviewed Ch Katie John Went, who leads it in the UK last year. Um, you can take out a human book and as long as you return them in the state that you found them, <laughs> uh, you have full permission to ask them any question. Yeah however obvious it might be about <laughs> them that. being uh, you know, d d a refugee, about being an amputee. It's a fascinating oh, example that. to have that full mm, permission. Yeah, Anything goes. Uh, Raj, how would you pick on the question? Yeah, and just, I mean, so it's building on that, really. One of the initiatives we have are called Empathy Guides. So a new joiner has writes a guide to themselves where they can share their, well, about their family or what they're interested in and how do I like to receive feedback or when do I take my lunch? And, and then you can get a better sense of your colleagues and it's a really great part of kind of onboarding. Uh, and then in the past, we've also done these who am I's where people, similar to what you were saying, Donna, to just presenting about yourself, letting people know. And I think that building that empathy is, is really critical. 
Oh, I like that. I was because if my wife was here, she'd say there isn't enough paper in the world to print that on. <laughs> so, we're just, so, so that's it. So I've got so many questions now. I'm just conscious with the team. I'm not seeing questions yet coming. Oh, as if by magic, they are now beaming through to me. So uh, let's take some questions from online. What? Uh, if you have two candidates who are equally as qualified for a role, what's the discerning factor that makes you decide one over the other? Mmm. Jenny, you gulped. Is that because you did <laughs> <laughs> it's, because, it's because I'm waiting for Jordan to put head in hand and say, please say the right thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think for me, I think um, it's about thinking about the culture of your business and thinking about bigger than qualifications. For me, I have a clearly defined vision for how I want my business to be. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, that cultural fit is very important. Um, you know, having a real sense of individuals in my business is important. Got it. People that have opinions, Policy. you know. R but equally, I think it's important to um, really think about wider attributes. It's always easy to think about more of an extroverted personality type, but actually, you really don't want to rule out more introverted people. Yes. So I think it depends on what stage the business is at what role you need and where your team's at and what attributes are really important. But for me, it's more uh, soft skills that I probably would look for. Interesting. Because, um, so, so Simon, it, I mean, it, it, it's crucial for any business, especially when you're growing an early stage business. You can't afford to get those calls wrong. So what's your answer to that discerning factor? I echo what Jenny said about it being soft skills. I, I like to look at mindset a lot compared with skills. If someone has an open mindset or a growth mindset, mm -hmm. especially when we're talking about diversity and inclusion, if you're quite fixed mindset, you might not even be aware of these issues. So you mm. could be coming into a business not aware that what you're saying could offend somebody or offend a customer. And mm. actually to have to shift your mindset, you could be quite a long way into the role before that's even become apparent. So can you, can, you, can you change your mindset or is it like the colour of your eyes? I think you can, but it's a conscious decision. I think you might be sort of rooted in one way and you really might have to sort of battle with your own bias to actually force yourself but i would say you can adapt from a fix yeah. to a growth mindset right so couldn't you say well don't worry about mindset because we can evolve that we're interested in skills we're interested in other things but if they've got the same skill set then i'd much rather hire someone on or even hire someone with less experience that could come in and actually would be willing to learn and would get on with the team straight oh. away than actually coming in and and disrupting the culture that we've you know cultivated over the last 10 years mm, interesting donna tell mm. me yeah, I've got to kind of challenge that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to look at a team as a whole and look for the diversity and what gaps have I got. Yep. So I would actually go for the opposite of what I think fits the team. Because okay. sometimes yep. I think that those challenging different views bring out different ideas and different solutions. So, yeah, I would do actually the opposite. Uh, I, yeah. I, can I just say I completely agree with that? I would be looking for what is additive to yeah, the team to the that team. I have. The thing mm. that you have to avoid in a team at all costs is groupthink. Mm. You don't want lots of people who think the same mm. way. So my decision will be based on who is the most additive in terms of a diverse perspective in our team. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I mean to, to, to help us square this, though, I mean, we just hear it's disruptive, 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 which, of course, is what gets everyone kicked out of class, which everyone hates in practice. I mean, I wonder how we square that. Um, let's have another question in, in, in the room, if we can. Have we got one? What? Yes, I see you in the red coat. That's a... Yeah, forgive me, no, because it'll be for our, <laughs> online, for our online audience. Um. I've been listening to what you're saying, and you're talking about work a lot, which is, which is really good, and, and what you're bringing in. But what was going through my mind is a, a lot of the, 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 the bias comes from, from a young age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what can industry do and governments do to start education institutes bringing the, uh, dealing with the bias at that age? Yep. No, that's to everyone in, on the panel. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Kate, please. Sure, and then I mean, I, I'm determined to hear from Raj only sorry, because he said... I, no, no, no. <laughs> no, because he set up the, um, the Secondary Schools Association way back in the day. But, Kate, please, first. Well, I, I think it's a great question. And um, I think it starts with education, actually. Mm. And one of the things that we've done at Medicom is invest uh, in a company called Fearless Futures, who, if you don't know them, you must find out about them. They're amazing. And they teach about oppression. So we've put 250 of our senior leaders on this course where you learn about oppression and what that allows you to do is develop an understanding of the lived experience of 
different people in those systems of oppression. So uh, the lived experience of Jewish people who've um, experienced uh, anti-Semitism, of, of Muslims who've experienced mm -hmm. Islamophobia, of black people who've experienced racism. So unless you understand what it's like to be in a system of oppression, you don't really, I, I don't think you're really able to make change in the world or in your organisation. So I think the earlier we start teaching children about oppression and about the reality of the lived experience of certain people in our world, then I don't think we can really change things. On that, Raj, briefly, how should we do that? I, I mean, I totally agree. I think a lot of it is around exposure, right? Is that if you live in a microcosm and you're, you go to a certain school where everyone looks like you, everyone's similar, socioeconomic background, it's not your fault. You just have no idea of anybody else's kind of challenges or what, or what they go through. And so the more we can encourage that, the exposure to, for young people at school through kind of education initiatives like Phyllis Futures and others, um, the more they'll develop that sense of empathy for people that don't look, sound or act like them. So, so, so if we're really sort of pushing the boundaries on this, um, we, as, uh, alas, we've just got under five minutes to go, but wh wh where should we really be pushing this agenda, Donna? Because I would hate to be accused of, not for you, but for me, of like platitudes. Yes, we've been saying that for five years. Where does the conversation need to go, Donna? Oh, you know, it needs to go. We don't have to have this conversation, yeah, basically. Yeah. That's, that's kind of the ultimate. Mm. Um, and I think we should be pushing and, and you know, stressing at every opportunity those those the rights of passage for absolutely everybody to be able to succeed in whatever it is that they want to do mm -hmm. so yeah i yeah the, the utopia for me would be let's not talk about it okay so, so a, any other brief takes on the sort of bridge that gets us there are there you know think about taboos think about stuff that we ought to be talking about but we just don't for whatever reason does anyone have a sense of that I think it's really challenging because i agree with what kate said in terms of how you deal with it but i think it can be really hard in practice. Um, so, I mean, we were talking earlier and, and I was mentioning a couple of things that, that, that have happened to me in a very short space of time. And it can feel very difficult to call it out in a way mm. Mm. Which, which is okay to do. Um, and I think that then reinforces that microaggression. I think it's fabulous um, what you're saying about that. Well, not fabulous, it happens, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and, I th and I think not saying it reinforces it, but it's very difficult to know how to do it. Yeah. So I think for me, that bridge is something that is, is, is really important. You don't want to be seen as argumentative or, you know, and creating of problems. Yeah. And, you know, oh, they're on at me again. <laughs> <It's> well, <laughs> and, of and often the situation <laughs> happens when you're in there to get something from the situation. Yeah. So you feel on an absolute back foot to address something. Mm. Yeah. But I think equity is important. So, so that there's not enough talk about equity, I don't think, because equity is differential treatment in an unjust world. Equality is the same treatment in an unjust world. So equity is about accepting that some people need additional support. So one of the mm. things that has been very successful for us is our sponsorship programme, where we put our black and Asian colleagues on a program where we pair them with senior leaders in the business. And those senior leaders advocate for those people, create platforms. And you know the whole point of that program is that we are accelerating yeah. the progression of people through the organization. Yeah. Be because yeah. I guess, um, Raj, only because only I want to see you in politics before too long. <laughs> um, uh, it, it, it does raise a, a bigger political question though, doesn't it? With big and small p, in the sense that we can say, look, everybody is different, everyone's an individual, and therefore we are going to treat everybody differently yeah. until somebody signs a klaxon and calls us out for unfairness. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the only thing I would, would add is that is the final thing which we're seeing in the, in the sector around belonging. So diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging. Yeah. And, and I think if that's the holy grail for me is that where people can, as you talked about, feel fully authentic, they can turn up to work as their full self and they feel that they belong there. Mm -hmm. And I think once you can do that as, as a company or, or in general, then we've kind of I suppose it hit yeah. the, the, the holy Because in a way, Simon, that can happen across organisations, can't it? I feel that sense of belonging around communities that we've met through. It's like we might be in different organisations, but whether it's through our entrepreneurship, yeah. it, it's not just in an organisation, is it? it? It can cut beyond. Yeah, I, I was saying that's one of the great things of actually the Great British Entrepreneur Awards is the feeling of belonging and community. Mm. Because so many of us through that, being an entrepreneur can be quite a lonely journey. Mm. Running a business can be lonely. You might not be surrounded by like-minded people necessarily. Mm. But actually through that, we've built friendships with people that we've stayed friends with for the last seven, eight, well, nine and, years. And, 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 and you must have seen, well, perhaps you've seen Donna and Kate, opportunity to meet your peers across different organisations. I wonder, would you, would you sort of call out any, any groups, networks that you have found 
particular sort of you know fellow travellers through, particularly on these topics in the in my industry. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I think I think we are coming together as an industry. I mean, one of the things that we did, um, the Advertising Association, in collaboration with the IPA, our governing you know our industry bodies, uh, they ran an all-in census last year, which was really a, a stake in the ground a, a, about representation in our industry, mm. and we are collectively working across six actions to change that yeah. and accelerate rep better Donna, representation. have you got that sort of... Yeah, so, uh, so one group, particular group I'm involved in is called Working in Industry and Government. And what's brilliant about that is it gave us the opportunity to tell each other what we really thought of them. So from a <laughs> private sector perspective, what we really thought of the public sector... With love. Know, with love. <laughs> and then for, you know, everything takes time, laborious, yada, yada, yada. And it would then the government gave their opportunity to talk about the private sector. You know, you're only about the money, right? So, yeah. and it was like, no, that's so not true. So it dispels all of those and breaks down those barriers. Yeah, no, 100%. Well, I'm hugely uh, grateful to, to you all for your time. So uh, to Simon, to Rajib, to Jenny, to Kate, uh, and of course to Donna, my massive thanks. Really, really helpful panel. Thank you, really enjoyed that. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Now, um, time is racing along. Listening to every single word of that, Hannah Previtt. Hannah, tell me what you think. That was a great discussion. You know what I'm like. I've been banging on about uh, women in business, women entrepreneurs, the lack of funding for women entrepreneurs uh, for the entire conference. So um, I was absolutely loving that discussion. And Donna's story is so compelling. Yeah. I think it really kind of brings it home that those human stories, you know, they just really resonate with us all, don't they? So uh, really, really great. And I have some uh, questions lined up for our panel afterwards. But before I do, Ollie, I just wanted to say on behalf of um, lots of of the women who work with you, what a great ally you are for us. And uh, for those of you that don't know, Ollie obviously hosts lots of things like this. He now refuses to host any panels that are manals, so all men, and they're exactly the kinds of allies we need in our life. So, oh, bless you, Hannah. Um, thank you. Thank yeah, that's got me into much. so many arguments, but yeah. Thank you. That's the rule. Uh, thanks, Hannah. Bless you. So uh, I know you're going to grill our audience backstage and uh, we're going to see everybody back in the main stage at two o'clock after lunch. So thank you. Over to you, Hannah. Uh, Thank you, Ollie. So please come and join me, Donna. As I was just saying, absolutely loved your story. So <laughs> <Thank> interesting. <you. laughs> Who would have thought you were a nurse to begin with? I know, with? I know. <laughs> you look back on your story and you're like, wow, how did oh, that happen? Oh, do you know what? It's really interesting because as careers go, I always thought there would be nothing finer than being a nurse from a job satisfaction perspective because you're actually saving lives. I work in tech now and you think, oh my God, how's that even, you know, how does that compare? But actually technology improves so many people's lives. So, you know, working in, whether it's in national health or, you know, those kind of organisations, I do genuinely think that, you know, I am still giving. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's important. And part of your story, of course, was about flexibility or the lack thereof of flexibility, right? So you had to change roles. Yes. So do, is that kind of filtered through now to your approach? You know, it's all about kind of flexible working where possible. Because obviously not all roles can be done flexibly, right? Like on, on production lines, for example. So, so I agree. There are some roles that can't be done flexibly. Um, I, I often think as well that some people challenge themselves to be like the person that they're working alongside or the person they're replacing and compare themselves and say, you know, he worked really long hours and he worked really hard. I can't possibly get that promotion. Mm -hmm. Just work smarter. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and I, I do endorse flexibility because, you know, work-life balance is hugely important. Uh -huh. um, and just mixing it up a little bit. So you're talking about, you know, the cars being built for men, by men, for <laughs> men. And it's true across the board with multiple different products. Have you ever experienced any kind of over-sexism or felt undermined by your male colleagues? And how have you dealt with it? You know, strangely enough, I haven't recently, but I was probably a victim myself because I made myself the victim. Mm -hmm. So I would always, you know, when I was more junior, I would go into a meeting situation and it wasn't somebody saying, oh, Donna, you take the minutes. It would be me feeling like I needed to add value mm -hmm. to the situation. Yeah. So I would automatically say, I'll take the minutes. And actually what that did in retrospect, or, you know, when I look back in hindsight, was I pigeonholed myself into, you know, 
the woman in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So, as you know, one thing that you know, actually my manager says to do is let people know the timbre of your voice. Mm -hmm. So when you first enter a room, you know, it would be great if there was complete diversity in the room. We're still in an organisation where sometimes you are the only woman. Um, do something when you first walk in the room so that they know that you're there, not just as a, you know, as a token. Mm -hmm. So it could just be, a, you know, could you pass the water? Mm -hmm. But actually give yourself a voice. Mm -hmm. Let people hear the temper of your voice. Mm -hmm. One last quick question. So last night we were at Networking Drinks and I met this amazing young woman and I think she's tuning in remotely today. And she was asking for advice on networking and when you go out to events, particularly if they're kind of male-dominated events, she works in the construction industry, obviously very yeah. male-dominated. When you walk into a room like that, what, what do you do first? Um, I would just go out, up, up to people and just introduce myself mm -hmm. and just handshake and just, you know, ask people what they do, who do they work for. And generally, you'll always find some kind of affinity that you yeah. can have a conversation about. So, yeah, I, I mean, you know, we're not talking about speed dating or anything. This is in a business environment. So therefore, why not just ask, you know, introduce yourself and say hi? Yeah, get stuck in. Yeah, absolutely. Always, I always have a glass of wine to start with, <laughs> personally, helps. but, you know, it's not for everyone. <laughs> um, OK, right, I think we're going to have to move on, but thank you so much. I can My pleasure. I talk to you all day. Thank you for joining okay, us thank you. today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Hi, Kate, come and join me. Hello, welcome. Hello. Thank you. I Hi. think your first time on the Elite Business Live yes, stage it is. today. Yep. Yep. Well, thank you for coming. I'm got, I've got a tricky question for you to start oh, with because okay. I'm a journalist <laughs> and that's what we do. Um, so obviously, a advertising and media has a bit of a reputation or it has done in the past as being, you know, it's like work hard, party hard, right? And not helped by things like Mad Men. Um, so do you think that you're kind of changing that because mm. the cultural piece is it's really important, isn't it? I've got two young kids. Would I want to go and work in a media agency with, you know, that kind of reputation historically? Can you dispel some of those myths for me? Well, I, I think that in Mediacom, we focus very, very um, clearly on culture. Mm -hmm. And we also measure how people feel they belong in the organisation. So we do that on an ongoing basis. So I think most people in our organisation feel that the company is doing a lot to support inclusion. Mm -hmm. And so I think we feel good about that. But I think the, the previous comment, the last comment I was making on the panel actually, is that the industry now has mm -hmm. come together and we are working together as one to try and tackle some of these issues mm -hmm. because we know we have poor representation, for example, at senior levels for people of colour. We know that women in senior positions are not fully represented. We have an issue with older people. You know, there's not many older people, like over 45, working in the advertising industry. So I think we've come together as an industry mm -hmm. uh, and are now working much more together to try and tackle some of those challenges, yeah. And like you were saying, it's about, it's that thing about what gets measured gets done, right? So you, that's kind of often the starting point, but then I guess enactioning that and making sure that you follow up with real tangible steps. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm afraid we're going to have to move on okay. again, but right. thank you thank so you. much for joining us, Thanks. Kate. Thank you. Hello. Hi, come here. Um, how was that for you? Yeah, really interesting. And yeah. nice to have a diverse panel as well. We were saying that it's between us upstairs having a really interesting chat as well. Yeah, lots of different industries represented as yeah, well. Yeah, definitely. I can imagine, are there lots of men in your business? Yeah, it's very male dominated. Although actually in our office, um, we're about 50-50 split. So it's quite nice. Um, again, we're having this conversation. It's really frustrating for us from the sort of diversity point of view is people call our office all the time and... Um, Kim, for instance, might pick up the phone and the question is, can I speak to somebody technical? And the men do oh. not get that at all. And it's really frustrating from our point of view because there's nothing we can necessarily do to change everybody's behaviour. Mm -hmm. We know how we operate, but it's really interesting to see that from sort of the outside in just because the number of calls we get coming into the office. That's absolutely shocking. So how many people do you have in your office? Oh, there's 10, of, well, 10 in the company, but spread across different locations. And so let me ask you, when you're growing a business, is this really at the forefront of your mind? And let me just caveat that by saying we're obviously in a skills crisis crisis, right? Yeah. It might be hard enough getting five applicants for a job anyway. If you then have to look at it through the lens of actually, you know, we're not very well represented in this area or that area, it gets really tricky. So when you're scaling a business, is yeah. this really forefront of your mind when you're recruiting? It's become more to the front of my mind as we've grown. Um, initially, it's not necessarily something you think about, which I'm aware of now when we're talking about awareness, actually being able to bring the fact I wasn't focusing on it before. 
Um, but again, I think with remote working, that's something that's actually come in. Actually, you can now weigh up, OK, could the person do the job from home? But actually, their culture and skills may really benefit the company, although they might only come into the office once a month. That's the option we've now got and can actually look at. Although there might be a skills shortage in certain areas, we can look further afield as well. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear more from you on this, but again, we must move on. So I hope we meet again. Yeah, come back, join us next year and get do. in touch. Thank you very much. Thanks. Jenny, if you could come and now join me. Thank you. Right, so we're going to go quick fire now. It is okay. really a like uh, speed dating. <laughs> <laughs> I've never done, so this is good. So, <laughs> so I'd like to ask you the same question, actually. Obviously, oh. growing quickly. Mm. Actually, I've spoken to loads of entrepreneurs in the kind of creative spaces who are finding it really hard to recruit at the moment. Is it something you think about? Uh, in terms of diversity, yeah. yeah. Um, yes, it's something I've actively thought about in the last um, year or so, um, and it has influenced my recruiting process. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't found it hard to recruit people, but what we've found hard is finding the right outlook and mindset. That's been the challenge. Um, it's, but yes, it's getting, it's getting easier. I think the more you're aware of your unconscious bias, the more you're aware of what you need, the easier it is to recruit in a more inclusive way. Mm -hmm. One other quick question before we move on to our last speaker. International Women's Day, do we still need it? I think we do. I think there is... Um, uh, well, we were talking before um, the panel about some anecdotal stories, and I've come across sexism here today. Um, and I think you, you get sexism in every single walk of life, um, and you get women held back. But equally, I work with a lot of my team to develop their self-esteem and just ingrained attitudes towards themselves, which can hold them back because they're female. So mm -hmm. I think we absolutely need it for all sorts of reasons, which we haven't got time to talk about. Right? And I'm absolutely there with you on that. So thank you very much, thank Jenny. You, Hannah. Thank you. Thanks. Hello, hello. We meet in person. It's been a really you. long time. So absolutely. obviously we last spoke on the phone. Did. Um, one, I'm going to change the tacks here slightly. Um, one of our uh, viewers at home has, has written to us and asked about perks, right? Mm -hmm. So obviously, small businesses haven't necessarily got super deep pockets. They can't offer the, the, the gym memberships, all the, all the benefits that we see that the likes of Google and those guys can offer to their staff. What are some of the small things they can do? And I have a feeling I know what you're going to say, because we yeah. talked about it for we an article for the Times just indeed. a few weeks yeah. ago. So it can start with simple things, it can't it? It can start with simple things, just like in terms of just recognizing people it could be what we have a surprise and delight initiative where we'll just send them a little gift in the in the post it could be you know, 20 pounds or, or it could be sending them a voucher obviously we work with a lot of clients actually give their employees a personal learning budget so give them you know a few hundred pounds to spend on their own development so what they want to learn based on how they like to learn um, but it doesn't need to be something elaborate and it could even be through time so you give them time off for volunteering it could be giving them an extra holiday on their birthday it could be Religious, we've introduced, you know, it for your religious leave. So any, if you celebrate, uh, uh, if you celebrate uh, uh, your faith, uh, and you can just take as much time off as you need for that. Or we have unlimited learning leave. So you can, if you, if money is a constraint, you can find other ways um, through time and other other means to reward and, and recognise people. Mm -hmm. Some really good tips there, I think. Um, you've grown quickly during the pandemic, right? So just remind me the kind of scale at which you've grown yeah. in terms of headcount. Yeah. So we've we've gone from probably twenty to seventy-five people in. In, in just over a year. Wow, that's incredible, isn't it? So, how have you trained? Uh, how have you trained them? How have you onboarded them when you haven't been able to physically meet? Because that is a challenge, isn't it? It is. It is really difficult. Um, uh, we have a fantastic people experience team, uh, really kind of detailed onboarding experience where we, you know, for the first few weeks, your buddy, you have a buddy, and uh, throughout that process, someone is in, di in a different team. We set up. You know, virtual coffees with people in different different departments. Um, we send them things in advance. They've got they've got a, a a kind of a notion page that they can follow what to expect. But also we have an open employee guide. So actually, even before you come to work at Learnably, you know what to expect, and and, and that may even act as a filter if you if you don't think that our culture is right for you. Mm -hmm. So we try to open source as many of our practices as possible, so people really know what they're getting in for before they've even applied for the job. Mm -hmm. So the more you can share about what to expect, make feel, people feel comfortable comfortable because when you're joining any role particularly in a remote world you're going to feel nervous and so whatever you can do to make people feel more comfortable with their first kind of start the better mm -hmm. and so just quickly is it possible to build company culture whilst you're working remotely and you're growing at that kind of speed it is absolutely but you have to be intentional about it mm -hmm. so you know we have kind of over-invested, I would say, in our people team. So for our size, we have a very large people function. Uh, but also, it's not just the responsibility of the people team. It's a responsibility of everyone. Mm -hmm. It starts from the top, but it's, it's your managers. It's every single person. And so 
whenever we interview people, we do do a, a kind of a values interview as part of that. But we don't look for fit, we look for co contribution. So how are you going to elevate our culture? But you have to be mindful of that, particularly in a remote or a hybrid world of work, to ensure that you do include intentionally, which is one of our values. So if you're having a meeting, someone's you know, dialing in, everybody should be on their camera, everybody should have their mm -hmm. kind of videos on, so that one person doesn't feel excluded from what's going on if the rest of your colleagues are sitting in person mm -hmm. in a meeting room. Really good advice there. That's it. That's all we've got time for. So thank you very thank much you. for joining us and for coming backstage for those closing comments. Thank no you. Problem. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Um, so that's all we have time for for the first part of the day. Uh,